Welcome, my fellow fat eaters. It's December 23rd. It's the eve of Christmas Eve. We got macadamia nuts roasting on the fire, sugar cookies, sugarless sugar cookies in the oven. Um, I just want to take a minute to sit down and talk about the true meaning of Christmas. Nah, I'm just bullshitting. We're going to talk about fat. So I know right around this time is when people kind of just give up on the thought of any sort of uh, diet or healthy eating lifestyle or really any lifestyle other than consuming massive amounts of sugar products and just kind of splurging on themselves and on others. And it's a, it's a joyous ho-ho-ho time. And then on January 1st is when we pay for our sins with a thing called New Year's resolutions. So in the spirit of those New Year's resolutions, I want to um, do a little maybe two-part podcast for anybody looking to start a ketogenic diet in the new year and that is because typically the number one thing on everybody's new year resolution list is to lose weight everybody wants to lose weight we're all fat america's fat the the whole planet's getting fat at least those that can afford to eat everybody's getting fat whether it's five pounds ten pounds twenty pounds a hundred pounds whatever the case may be um looks like everybody wants to lose some weight in the 38 weeks that I've started this diet, I've lost 90 pounds now. I did have like a two-month stall, which I'm going to talk about later. I've determined the reason why. I lost like maybe three pounds. So it wasn't a complete stall, but three pounds in two months was a drastic decrease from the two pounds a week average I had been losing. Um, so I found out the reason why, so I want to talk about that at the end uh, of this. But to get started, um, I want to cover maybe the the 10 things that nobody tells you about um, when you start a ketogenic diet. And that's because a lot of people don't know, and those that do know just don't really talk about it. We figure it's something you learn in time, but it makes life a lot easier to know this going into it. So uh, we'll jump right into that. The number one thing is cardio is not necessary. We've been told a lot of lies that you know, grains are good, which we know is a lie. At least we know that. The whole world hasn't accepted that yet. But we've also been told that cardio is good for you, especially if you want to lose fat. And I'm not going to argue that cardio is bad for you. I don't believe that. I don't believe working out is bad. I don't believe cardio is bad. What I do believe is if your goal is fat loss, cardio is not necessary. And to some extent, doing massive amounts of cardio will work against your ultimate goal of fat loss. If your goal is to become, you know, a superior triathlon athlete or to complete a Spartan race or to, you know, become fucking Lance Armstrong and complete the Tour de France, dude, go do a two-hour cycle class because that's in line with your goal. If your goal is to lose fat, you have to understand that doing massive amounts of cardio could potentially work against that. For one... Massive amounts of cardio will decrease muscle size. I don't care what anyone says. Look at any of the top endurance athletes and tell me how much muscle mass they have. Exactly. So for one thing, it's going to destroy muscle mass. We know that the more muscle mass you have, the more fat you burn naturally. So that's one. Two, when you do massive amounts of cardio, you're you're using a tremendous amount of energy. Energy that needs to be replaced. Energy that's replaced by eating. So the more cardio you do, the more you're going to eat. So could you lose weight doing lots of cardio? Of course. Is it the most effective way to lose fat? And there's a difference between losing weight and losing fat. And it's simply not. I mean, following ketogenic diet alone um, and just moderating how much you eat, which I didn't put that on this list. But that's another one too, this whole theory that you can eat whatever you want to eat and you won't gain weight on a ketogenic diet, that is also a lie because, you know, this is not a magic pill, you know, you eat 4,000, 5,000 calories, even if on a ketogenic diet, they're they're fat, you're going to gain weight. So that's the kind of the point of not, not overdoing cardio is also not overeating. So cardio, while not bad, definitely not necessary and too much of it could hinder weight loss. So keep that in mind. Uh, Number two, people are going to criticize you for doing this diet. 
and not only will they criticize you, they're going to offer you um, a better alternative. And the better alternative will vary depending on what the person believes is healthy. And that could be a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, or probably the most common diet is, well, why don't you just follow like a balanced diet? Like eat lots of grains, eat lots of fruit, and, you know, moderate protein and low fat, no fat. Uh, which is probably the diet that has gotten everyone unhealthy to begin with. And it's funny that it's viewed as this um, healthy diet, but it's not. So you have to be prepared for that, especially especially if you lead with, I'm on a high-fat diet. I used to say that all the time, and people get crazy, man. Like They will tell you you're going to have a heart attack. They're going to tell you, but yeah, but your cholesterol is through the roof. And everybody is a fucking... Doctor, everybody's a fucking scientist. The funny thing is, is when you tell somebody something healthy, like MCT oil. I told somebody once, like, something about giving, you know, my kids coconut oil and MCT oil. And they're like, well, that's not healthy for kids. And it's like, dude, you give your kid McDonald's. Like, everybody goes and becomes a researcher. And they go, like, is MCT oil healthy? Meanwhile, you're drinking fucking two liter of Dr. Pepper. Um, so the world is full of crazy peoples. Don't listen to the crazy peoples, okay? Number three, results and how quickly you get them, they do vary. And this is important because when I started this diet, I don't know if you want to call me a lucky or whatever you want to call it, I did lose about 23 pounds in the first two weeks. Um, a lot of that is water weight. You shed water initially. You're shedding your glucose stores. Uh, later, those glucose stores refill with free fatty acids. But you're going to shed weight. For me, I shed a lot of weight. And it was awesome. It was, I'll be honest with you. It was inspiring to me. It motivated me to really commit to doing this, um, which helped me through the hardest phase, which is like the first month when you, know, you have to break old habits. That weight loss, though not fat loss necessarily, uh, that weight loss helped motivate me to stick to it. When my wife decided that she wanted to, to start a ketogenic diet, she did not lose anything for the first three weeks. And she was very not happy about that. And she was very not happy at me. She blamed me specifically for it. And I just tried to tell her like, look, it's, it works. Like I had been already doing the diet for like maybe 25 weeks, give or take at that time. And so I told her like, look, just commit to it. Like it's a process. I'm telling you, you'll feel great. And she didn't believe me for the longest time, but she stuck to it. And then at about the three week mark, she just started dropping weight and she measured herself and she had lost a lot of inches already in her stomach, way more than weight she lost, you know? So it's one of those weird things that you could be losing fat and gaining muscle or you could be losing fat or you could be, it, you really don't know. Or you could be like me, you could shed a lot of water weight um, initially and everybody's kind of on, on their own pace when it comes to how you start this diet and that goes to everything. Like I was sick for like four weeks. If you go back and listen to like week two ketogenic diet review and week three, I feel like I have a fucking frog in my throat. Like I'm horse as shit. I sound like Vin Diesel. Um, and I, I, it was rough, man. I had the flu for like four weeks. It just kicked my ass. And that was the sugar withdrawal. And that was my body having to reacclimate to there's no longer being high levels of glucose. Now I'm running on ketones and it was rough. I didn't have any of the superior mental benefits. Um, I may have thought I had them back then, but it wasn't until I really got them that I saw what people were talking about. Um, and so just keep that in mind. Uh, it's not how quickly you get to where you want to be. It's getting there. And that's important because we, we like to put times on everything. We want to be, you know, by my birthday in February. That's not my birthday, people. My birthday is in July. But by my birthday, I want to lose 10 pounds. And so you're giving yourself a month to lose 10 pounds. And maybe the goal should just be I want to lose 10 pounds. And if it takes a month, that's awesome. If it takes three months, like, the point is you get to where you want to go. And ultimately that's the point, you know, it's life is about the journey. So just, you know, appreciate that. Let, let the ketogenic diet become a lifestyle and let it, let it become the journey and you'll get, you'll get your results. I promise you, you will get the mental clarity. You will get all these amazing benefits that everyone talks about because this diet is not for me. 
It's not for a select group of people whose genes genetically allow them. No, man. This is for everyone. If you're human, as long as you're not some like undercover alien from Mars, this diet is for you. You will get these benefits because this is how the human species evolved through periods of basically running on a ketogenic diet on ketones. And there's a whole lot of uh, scientific shit that I can hit you with and biological and paleolithic shit, but you can do that research yourself. I promise you, there's not one person that won't benefit from this diet. It just, it may take you a little longer to adapt. Or you may be like me. Boom. You may lose weight like crazy. You may get sick. You may be like Alex, who I podcast with. You know, he didn't get sick at all. Like three days later, he's like, dude, I feel amazing. And I was like, fuck you, bro. Because I was sick for four weeks. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the point of that is just like, just know, man, everybody's body change is different. Don't go in this saying, I'm going to lose five pounds the first week because if you don't lose, you know, you're going to be disappointed. Or you may be like, I could have lost a half a pound, you know, just doing cardio. Um, so don't don't set your expectations too high. Understand that everybody's body is different. Number four, this diet is easier than it sounds, but you do have to... Um, sacrifice some so i know like the main thing that everyone says is like i can never ever do that and i agree with you 100 percent because i used to say that too when i would hear people say things like i don't eat any sugar i thought in my head like bro you're fucking crazy man because chocolate cake is bomb and i'm not doing that or you know the better answer is i would rather live a life uh you know happy and die sooner than to not live happy at all. People say that shit about dieting when you tell them to stop eating fast food or stop eating this or stop eating sugar. Um, they just have this vision of like, well, you must be miserable, so I would rather die happy, full of cancer um, and obese. And the truth of the matter is, is like, I don't feel that way at all anymore. I, I haven't eaten any sugar really. Like there's some sugar in some products I eat, but it is so minimal. Um, I'm talking like a gram of sugar, maybe in my peanut butter or something that I can't help because I'm not fancy and I don't make my own peanut butter yet. Um, but I, I've completely eliminated all, all processed stuff, basically all processed like sugars and, and different things of that nature. And it is a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, and it was a lot easier than it sounded initially, but it would be a lie for me to try to say you're not going to miss things. I mean, there's challenges. Like if you go to a barbecue place, I don't eat barbecue sauce um, on my barbecue anymore. I eat my barbecue with ranch um, or blue cheese and hot sauce because most barbecue sauce has a lot of sugar in it. And so there's things like that. Like you are going to have to sacrifice and you could go out and you could find, you know, recipe for your own barbecue sauce and sneak that shit in if you want. Um, but there's sacrifices that are going to be made and it, you have to know that going into it. Number five, uh, there are no cheat days or even cheat meals for that matter. And this is probably the number one thing that I see people doing wrong is to think that you can do a ketogenic diet for two days and then you have a bad day, but that's okay. You'll be back on the horse tomorrow. Um, this happens a lot with exercise, fitness programs, like I'm going to do insanity every day. And then by day five, you're like, well, it's just one day. I'll take one day off. Uh, this is not really effective on a ketogenic diet. And especially if you get in a bad habit of doing it too soon, it's really going to work against you because you have to adapt. Your body has to adapt to ketones being the primary uh, source of energy. And if you're constantly disrupting that with high carb, high glucose meals, that's never going to happen. Your body will just kind of always feel like shit waiting for the glucose to come. And then after two days, you break because you've never become keto adapt. So your body feels like shit. Your body needs carbs, man. It needs it. It needs it. It doesn't really, but that's the sort of energy source you have. So your body thinks it needs it. So you have to break that. Your body has to become keto adapt. You have to be burning ketones as a, as a primary source of energy. And then if you have a bad meal or a bad cheat day, it may kick you out of ketosis. You may have to go through another two days of getting back to being fully keto adapt. 
if you're really keto adapt, like fucking 38 weeks in, I could probably sit here and eat a whole pizza if I wanted. I would feel like shit. I'd probably feel like I was dying. But the next day, more or less, my body would be back um, to burning ketones because it's fully, fully, fully keto adapt for me at this point. But um, initially going into it, you really don't want to get in a bad cycle of, of going three days good, but then you have a bad meal on Wednesday, and then you're back on the horse Thursday and Friday, and then Saturday you have a bad meal. And then Sunday, you know, you just kind of did decent. And then Monday through Wednesday, don't get in that cycle. Um, this is not the diet for that. I mean, maybe the South Beach diet or, or some of those other diets, like well, on a ketogenic diet, you got to think the whole purpose is suppressing insulin. When you have a cheat meal, you're shooting your insulin through the roof. You have to steadily suppress your insulin for an effective amount of time for this to really um, take effect. So, like I said, commit to it the first month. No cheat meals, no cheat days. Um, it's really that's an important one. Six. You will become freakishly informed about the things you eat, how your food is prepared, and the ingredients that are used. Um, that is another one of those things. Like the guy who said, "I don't eat sugar." The guy who's like well, what's in my food? Or asking the chef, how did you cook this? I was like, dude, that's embarrassing. Don't do that. Now I do that all the time. Or better, I go to places where I can cook my own food or I go to places where I know the food is, you know, of a, a raw or organic type nature. Um, I just really try to control everything about my food. Um, a beautiful, 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 beautiful side effect of doing this is you eat out less. You're going to save more money. A lot of people say, isn't it expensive to eat that way? It's like, not really. I don't eat out nearly as much as I used to. Before starting this diet, I easily ate out at least two meals, a minimum of two meals a day. Um, most of them were either fast food or, or otherwise unhealthy choices. Now when I do eat out, I look for, for healthier options um, as much as possible. I mean, you, there's no perfect, perfect way of doing this diet, I believe. Um, the best is you just you try to stay informed and that kind of will start to implement itself into you asking questions about your food. If I've never been somewhere before and I haven't had a chance to like research them, I will ask, man, I'll ask what's in the guacamole. And that sounds crazy because guacamole is avocado, but you would be surprised the shit that different places put in uh, guacamole. I had a, a place tell me that they put sugar in their guacamole and I was like, why would you do that? Did you think it was salt? And they're like, no, um, our customers just like it a little sweeter. And I was like, you're batshit crazy. But it's important to ask, man, because you'll find things like that. Like I've talked about it before. I ate a Caesar salad once, no croutons, nothing, went home, did my research because I wanted to, you know, plan out my macros, um, which I don't really do macros too much anymore because I'm pretty set in the way I eat and I know how things look kind of in my head. But back then I used to do my macros and I found out that that place, their Caesar dressing, had 20 fucking carbohydrates in it, um, which I can only imagine was maybe from sugar or something of that nature. Um, but you will you will start to become informed and you'll put a lot more thought into, into what you eat and these long laundry lists of ingredients, they go out the window. Especially the longer you do this diet, your your food really becomes pretty simple. Like it, it is what it is. It's celery or it's, you know, cauliflower or it's it's very simple single ingredient foods. Um, number seven, weight loss, and by that I mean fat loss is all about suppressing insulin. I talked about this in detail in an older podcast, um, so I, I do want to just kind of revisit that and talk about that because I think it's in important um, and it's why one of the reasons why people say why doesn't a moderate ba diet balance with lots of fresh fruit and lots of whole grains um, that's a better option for weight loss and it's not because you got to remember glucose was something that humans and glucose is carbohydrates or sugar it's something that humans didn't really evolve eating we only started agriculture about 10,000 years ago um, in Egypt and in the North Americas they didn't start agriculture here until about 5,000 years ago. So you got to think, uh, From I don't want to offend a lot of religious people, but for a very, very, very long time, humans ate a certain way. And 10,000 years ago, 
humans started eating another way. So that is not long enough time for humans to really have adjusted to these high levels of um, glucose. And the side effect of that is what we've been seeing, lots of disease, lots of obesity, um, cancers, different things. Believe it or not, they're, they're one of the biggest culprits are is grains. Um, so what happens is the body did develop from primitive times when we'd find berries or different things or even wild plants that had uh, carbohydrates and, and spiked your 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 insulin your glucose in your in your body. Um, when glucose was present in the body, it's poisonous. Um, you can ask any doctor; they'll tell you it's poisonous. So the body created a way to not die from this shit, and that was insulin. So your pancreas creates insulin, squirts it into your body. You, you know, fucking insulin. They're like SEAL Team Six. And glucose is like Bin Laden. And SEAL Team 6 is going to go in there and grab Bin Laden, fuck him up, and hide his body in your fat cells. So that's what insulin does, man. It goes into the body. It attacks the glucose. It grabs the glucose. And it shoves the glucose into your body. Uh, that way, it can't poison us. The problem with that process is when the glucose is being shoved into your body, your body can't burn fat anymore. The, the fat cells cannot be actively burned while they're being used for storage. So what you have is the body stores fat. So when you're eating high levels of, you know, grains and fresh fruits, the healthy stuff, basically that prompts your body to store fat. And it's it's pretty insane, man, because the sugar that's found in fruit, which is fructose, is actually worse for your body than cane sugar. So the sugar that we typically think of as bad, which is cane sugar, which I'm not a fan of or saying go out and eat that, but the fructose in the fruit or there's the sugar in the fruit, the, the fructose actually spikes your insulin more than sh cane sugar does. And the same is with grains, like two, two slices of grain bread, that'll spike your sugar levels in your body and cause more insulin to be released than if you just had two tablespoons of sugar. It's insane. That two slices of bread is the equivalent of two tablespoons of sugar. And there's no real nutritional value. Some fruits, they do have some nutritional value. I won't try to deny that. But, you know, you're going to have to find alternative means for some of them or you're going to have to um, just completely uh, eliminate that because it's not going to aid in fat loss. Uh, it's one of those things too where people will be like, well, I'm still going to eat that because it's healthy. Not on a ketogenic diet. Your insulin will spike. You're not going to get the, the benefits that you're looking for. So stay away from it. Um, number eight, when you, when you don't eat sugars for a while, everything starts to taste sweeter. So this is crazy. Um, I had never heard of this and I just one day had noticed it, but I, I forget what I was what I was doing, I think I was eating um, a salad or something, and I started just looking at my salad funny, and my wife actually made the salad, and I told her, I was like, what did you put in the salad? And she's like, oh, she had just made it with like olive oil, it was like a lazy, lazy salad, you know what I'm saying? And it's because it tasted sweet to me, and I was convinced she had put sugar on it, and when I told her that, she even told me, she's like, you know what, I noticed that the broccoli we ate last night tasted sweeter, and... It's, it's weird, man. Like, I thought, like, it's just crazy. I must have a tumor. Um, and I researched it, and it's funny. Um, it's actually the reason humans have what we call a sweet tooth is it's, it's, it's um, I guess you'd call, like, a, a genetic thing to let us know food is not poisonous. So typically, um, like, wild leaves and stuff that you find or that you would have been eating 10, 20,000 years ago if you were alive, um, if, the, if the leafy greens tasted sweet, they're edible. So it's believed to be that's why humans have a sweet tooth is from back when we were hunter gatherers and we were eating wild herbs and different, you know, leafy greens. If, if it was sweet, it was safe for, for human consumption. So, but you start to pick up on that a little bit, like certain things that you don't associate as being traditionally sweet. Um, they become very sweet. And then certain things like even like peanut butter, um, can become too sweet. And I'm going to talk about it a little, little bit later, but like Diet Coke was one of those things where um, when I first started drinking Diet Coke, I hated it. Um, and then I started drinking it because I believed it was healthier because we're told that it's healthier. And then on a ketogenic diet, it just got to the point where even Diet Coke, 
I would constantly like going back to like asking people what's in your food. I would drive waiters and waitresses crazy because I would tell them like, this is diet, right? Yeah. yeah. I said, are you sure this is diet? And then I'd have one of my kids taste it and they'd say, Ew, it's diet. Uh, because it would start to taste too sweet. Um, so you get a, like a heightened sense of that, that, um, sweet tooth. Uh, number 10, uh, oh no, no, number nine, uh, the physical and mental benefits can't adequately be described. You have to experience them to understand. So the main thing is like mental clarity. You hear that a lot. And it's like, well, what exactly does mental clarity mean? Or what, how much energy am I going to get? Am I going to be like on crack? Um, is it going to feel like I just drank a Red Bull? Like what are we talking about here? And it's just different, man. Like I don't want to hype things up. You're not going to become Einstein. You know what I mean? You're going to be maybe a little sharper than you were before. You're not going to all of a sudden become fucking, you know, Steve Jobs and start creating tablets out of, you know, fucking cardboard boxes and discarded computer components, you know? You're going to still be you. What I think there is, is we all kind of walk around feeling like shit a little bit, but we're so used to feeling like shit that we don't know we feel like shit. And it's not until you kind of remove the thing that's making you feel like shit that you start to realize, one, I used to feel like shit, and two, I feel great now. A uh, perfect example of that is everybody I know, and myself when I used to eat a normal type of diet, after you eat, man, you want to go to sleep. You're just like, ah, oh, food coma. I hear that all the time. I'm in a food coma. Oh, I have no energy. And you got to think about it. Eating is a source of energy. Why, if we consume energy, do we feel de-energized? And it's, it's because we're eating the wrong types of food. We're eating food that crashes us. We're eating food that, instead of making us feel good, is actually, in a sense, making us sick. You know? So... I consider that mental clarity, it's not necessarily that you're getting some heightened sense. It's that that brain fog that used to be there was there all the time and you didn't even notice it was there anymore. It's gone. I don't get headaches anymore. I don't get, you know, exhausted in the middle of the day. Uh, I just like, for me, it's normal at this point, but all those things that, that existed before, they go away. And when they go away, boy, do you feel different. And you actually notice that they're no longer there. You'll notice that, you know, you're not tired anymore. You'll notice that you have more energy. You'll notice that your endurance goes up. You're not going to get as winded. You're not going to like burn out as easy. And that's because you're not using glucose anymore. So before you had X amount of energy in reserve, when you deplete that energy, it's time to eat more glucose, time to eat more carbs because you need to replenish, uh, your, your glycogen stores and on the ketogenic diet it's not necessary so you can go much longer much harder um without feeling the effects of it without feeling that crash that you know if anybody's ever had an energy drink that crash we exist in a state of that crash when the way humans should feel is how we feel when we drink the red bull so when you start a ketogenic diet slowly you know that crash gives way to the feeling you had when you were on the red bull which is you know, a little sharper, a little more energized, um, and just better. All around, you feel better. That's the best way I can describe it. But again, it doesn't do justice. It's one of those things that to fully understand it, you have to just, you know, you have to experience it. It's really the only way. Number 10, and I saved this for last because this is where I'm going to lose most of you, is you're going to get diarrhea. It's a given. Um, you're going to get diarrhea and you're going to get used to having diarrhea and the word diarrhea is gross and I apologize for saying it, but it is something that you need to come to terms with and we joke about it, me and, you know, Alex and everybody that I know that does a ketogenic diet. It's a funny thing because like in the middle, even when I'm podcasting with Alex sometimes, he'll just be like, give me that look and I know that look, that means I got to go use the bathroom and so we'll have to pause our podcast and, and take a break and... It's just the nature of, of the way the way you're eating when you're eating lots of fat, especially if you're if you're if you're uh, supplementing with some MCT oil, which is huge and is hugely helpful for this diet. Especially if you're blending coffee, MCT oil is beautiful and it'll accelerate a lot of the benefits of a ketogenic diet and it'll really help you with fat loss and so many different things. And it'll cause diarrhea. I guarantee it. So be prepared. Um, there are some things you can use, which is like um, certain fibers. Some people say psyllium husk helps. 
Some people say a psyllium husk actually is, um, is, has a laxative effect. It's one of the fibers that has a laxative effect. But to some people, the, you know, psyllium husk helps. Some people get constipated and they take psyllium husk, which helps them move the bowels. Um, and some people take it because they have the moving bowels and they want the bowels to get a red light for a little bit. So it's one of those things though, man, like you just get used to it. In the beginning, it's annoying. You just kind of get used to it. Your body regulates a little bit, but for the most part, especially like I said, if you're using MCT oils, you're going to have, you know, you're going to get used to it. That's all I want to say about that before I discuss everybody in the room. Um, and then I just want to talk just for a second, you know, with, um, with, with the New Year's resolutions and whatnot, you know, we'll do a part two of this next week. Maybe like the, I don't know, 10 misconceptions or something. I'll, I'll think of something. Um, but one, th I just wanted to mention uh, a couple different books that I've been reading, which I think uh, is going to help anybody, especially if you, you know, you want to change the way you eat and you want to change the way you view diet and you think that, you know, a, a person with a big red beard is maybe not the most trustworthy source of information, which you're probably part of the population of sane people on this planet. Um, there's a couple books that I've been reading, which I think are, are really helpful and it's where I get a lot of my knowledge from, what little bit of knowledge I have. And also I feel like um, when you feed your mind these sort of things, it helps you stay positive. It help, helps you stay motivated um, on a ketogenic diet. And it also, you know, like I said, when, when people don't understand you, if, if you're lucky enough to have people around you, especially, you know, people that want to be healthy and want to do good, if you can get them doing the ketogenic diet with you, awesome. If you can get a spouse, a husband, a, a wife, if you want to get your kids doing it, look, there's nothing wrong with putting children on a ketogenic diet. In fact, the ketogenic diet was founded to treat children who suffered epilepsy. You know, they put them on this high fat diet. The children... That, that suffered severe epilepsy, the epilepsy completely stopped, but also children, you know, became healthier. And one of the byproducts of it was weight loss. And, you know, all these amazing things happened. So the diet was discovered as a diet, so to speak, in children. So by all means, you can, you can get your children doing this lifestyle um, much the same way you could get children eating paleo. There's nothing but good benefits. Um, so the point of that is, is if you can get people around you engaged and conscious of how they eat and, and what they put in their body, you won't feel alone. You're going to find a lot of people who are just not going to be open to it, you know, especially if you lead with high fat. If you lead with high carb, maybe people will be like, yeah, I've heard about that. But if you lead with high fat, forget it, man. They're going to think you're nuts. But anyways, I've been reading a couple different books, which I think will help you not feel so alone to see that there's other people out there and there's smart people out there that are kind of along the same conscious thread of thought um, about how you eat and how you move and different things. So one book that I really love and I, I, I've read it and I continue to reread it because I always get little nuggets of wisdom is The Primal Blueprint by Mark Sisson. It's a great book. Um, it's not necessarily 100% ketogenic because he does eat a lot of fruits. But like I was saying, he even stresses in that book um, about how eating high levels of fruit can uh, work against fat loss goals. So it's not a ketogenic book per se, but um, there's a lot of the same levels of consciousness and of thought that, that is in tune with, say, a ketogenic diet. Um, another book is Wheat Belly by William Davis, who's a doctor, who in this book, he's talking a lot about how basically um, – the, the obesity epidemic and um, a lot of the health problems that we're having in this country are derived from eating wheat and eating grains and glucose and sugar. Um, so that's a really good book. I haven't finished it, but um, it's really informative and it helps a lot. Uh, Grain Brain is another book by another doctor written by David Perlmutter. Sorry, I have the books over here. That's why I have to look at the title so I don't get the names wrong. Uh, but Grain Brain is similar to Wheat Belly, but Grain Brain is written by this uh, doctor who is a neurologist. And he basically proved a link between many of the mental disorders we suffer from, um, Alzheimer's and different things of that nature. Um, 
and consuming grains and how a lot of these conditions didn't exist prior to humans eating grains. Um, he also talks about how, you know, parents who are uh, gluten intolerant, who have the celiac disease, um, they have bad reactions to the protein gluten, which is found in wheat. But the interesting thing is their children are, have a much, much higher rate of suffering from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, ADHD, hyperactive disorder, all these different things. And he's basically saying that all humans on some level are being affected by grains and that the Alzheimer's and different, you know, um, depressions, a lot of the things people suffer from um, are a result of the grains and the high levels of grains. And also people got to remember the grains that we eat, they're not even like the grains that were being eaten 10,000 years ago. All the grains now are modified. They're genetically modified. So you're not even eating really nutritional grains anymore. You're just eating glucose. There's, there's really no nutritional value in grains anymore. So if there ever really was that much, which we don't even know that there ever really was a lot, but good book, especially good book for anybody that deals with maybe depression or, you know, worried about Alzheimer's, maybe Alzheimer's runs in your family or any sort of, you know, brain disorder. It's, this guy's smart, man. Way smarter than me. I don't do the book justice talking about it, but um, it's basically the, the premise of the book is the surprising truth about wheat, carbs, and sugar, your brain's silent killers. Um, so check that book out. And then just two other books, just kind of like on a, on a health level, not necessarily diet level. Um, I've been reading Faster, Higher, Stronger, which is a, a book by Mark McCluskey, which is how sports science is creating a new generation of super athletes um, and what we can learn from them. So it basically is, is uh, sharing the secrets that super athletes have, have had through um, sports science and what was once only accessible to those that had the means to do it now you know you can you can take away a lot of those lessons and same practices and then the last book uh, that I want to talk about is learning to breathe fire which is kind of talks about the rise of CrossFit and the primal future of phys fitness which is written by JC Hurst uh, this book is clearly uh, CrossFit bias so I will say that is an, it's not necessarily a one-sided thing it's meant to sell you on the benefits of CrossFit but the reason why I like it is it's super motivating man like when I when I read it like just the entry to it when they're talking about these people running and you know it's the middle of winter and the CrossFit class is running out and the people are running amongst the cars and they're you know smoke is coming out of their breath and the writer talks about how they look like a more of a pack of, of animals than of a singular you know person but super motivating for anyone who's into the primal or into the kind of like you know unleashing the full potential of the body I find it hugely motivating. I don't do CrossFit, but <laughs> I like the book. So that's that for this week. Um, just leave it at that. Merry Christmas to everybody or whatever non-secular version of Christmas you celebrate. Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Feliz Navidad, Noche Die, whatever. Just have fun, man. Spend time with the family. You know? But have fun. Eat your sugar. Eat your cookies. But January 1st, put those New Year's resolutions into action, man. And I promise you, commit to the ketogenic diet and you won't regret it. Next week, we'll do we'll do the second part of this. Um, still in line with the New Year's resolution and anyone looking to switch over. Um, so listen to the next podcast we do next week. It'll be a, a part two to this. Other than that, good night, love each other, be kind, uh, goodbye.